Okay, so um, to start with, I think you know a lot of us are drawn to um, to, to terracotta because of the you know its inherent kind of tactile qualities. You can go to the next slide, Amy, um, that we see in a lot of historic precedents. Um, and you know we've been looking at it in a lot of projects that we've been working on lately, um, and uh, looking at how we might be able to bring some of that tactile and um, you know, the more intricate details uh, from those precedents into our work now. Um, so we're looking at Amy showed the Park Loggia in New York, and here our project at 28 and 7th uh, in New York. Um, and you can see that you know we're, I think because of the scale of projects that we're working on, typically we're kind of shoehorned into a, an extrusion method of, of fabrication um, that often kind of you know works against some of that more detail uh, detail quality of the historic precedents. And that's something that you know we're increasingly trying to challenge. Um, if you go to the next slide, Amy, um, we're starting to look at uh, ways that we can work with terracotta in a way that really celebrates the extrusion profile um, and kind of tries to break out of the, the linear um, appearance that you often get with extruded uh, terracotta. Uh, and that was kind of a, a kicking off point for our work in the ceramic assembly workshop last year. Um, so we looked at several different methods of how we might um, you know focus on breaking free from that that linear expression of terracotta um, through post manipulation of uh, extruded terracotta components um, so we looked at several methods last year um, saw cutting cnc cutting um, you know some manual methods with wire cutting um, and you know various forms and you can see in the the final assembly last year that you know, what we landed on was a kind of um, you know this marrying of a curved terracotta profile uh, in the extrusion with planar cuts that allowed us to kind of you know introduce some curvature and and variation into the facade um, through through that post manipul post extrusion manipulation of the terracotta. Um, so if you go to the next slide, Amy, one of the things that really kind of sparked our interest last year at the workshop when we were able to be there in person um, was being able to take part in some of the early tests that Peter Schmidt was doing um, in Boston Valley's plant with the wire cutter. Um, so with this CNC method um, of wire cutting, we were able to break free from that planar um, cut that we were doing with most of our uh, assembly last year. And it started to kind of allow us to push beyond um, you know, those, the kind of simple planar cuts and introduce a whole range of new possibilities. And that was really where we kicked off um, with our work this year. So if you go to the next slide. Um, so again, this year we're really focused on involving that cut plane and looking at how we might uh, you know, kind of advance into some more unique and um, you know, intricate cuts. So the, the first few things that we did, you can go to the next slide, Amy. Um, working with Peter, um, we went through several different tests of how we might uh, you know, play with the, the wire cutter, um, what kind of forms we might be able to achieve. And I think those really started to inform some of the early tests that we did. And Amy will um, will jump into that and how we, how we thought we might be able to do that. Yeah, so thank you, Eric. We started, you know, working with Peter virtually um, in the Boston Valley shop. And so a lot of our initial explorations were about whether it was possible to potentially get multiple pieces out of a single terracotta extrusion, just kind of working with what they had. And then we also were doing a little bit of form finding, seeing what uh, deflections would look like and uh, what different curvatures of cut planes might look like uh, when applied to the actual wet terracotta. Uh, and so we started playing around um, in 3D. We had some early ideas about uh, using the wire cutter to produce interlocking extrusions. Um, and we were still thinking about a flat surface or maybe a screen at this point. And then uh, we started looking at um, the interaction between a very simple extrusion profile um, and a more complex geometric cut plane. So even a very simple ruled surface 
applied to a simple waffled uh, extrusion really started to produce a lot of curvature and complexity in the finished pieces. And so we started to think about both the actual profile of those extrusions and how that could work with a facade. Um, we looked at uh, how that might aggregate over larger surfaces. And so we sent some of these tests back and forth with Boston Valley um, and started to understand what, um, what these extrusions and these cuts might mean uh, for the actual fabrication. Uh, we thought we had some interesting discovery here where when the, um, the web of the extrusion was turned at an angle to the predominant direction of the cut plane, you started to get um, a lot more interlocking and interwoven um, appearances on the cut surface. And then we also started to experiment with the edge profile of our extrusions here to think about how you might start to conceal joints between panels um, as you have this continuous cut surface and the mass customization that the wire cutter affords within an extruded uh, universe. And so in the end, uh, we went in the direction of a column study. We thought the three dimensionality that the wire cutter afforded was really best shown off uh, in this form in the round. And although the wire itself is limited to um, a ruled surface just because of the nature of the machine, uh, you can really start to move that around by uh, using a spiral that um, circles around multiple uh, die shapes. And so um, we did some form finding and geometry studies with that column itself. And um, we had this terracotta profile to play with to get a little bit of a better idea of um, how some of those shapes might react. So uh, we did a little bit of testing as well at the efficiencies of whether it uh, made sense to cut multiple people pieces simultaneously, and then you get start to get alignments uh, produced across those pieces. Um, and as we went through that, we were refining our die profile. Uh, so we had started with this one, which you saw earlier, and then these um, waffle pieces on the edges, as we called them, uh, really served to conceal some of those vertical joints. Uh, and then we we're able to use an existing die plate from Boston Valley, as we saw with uh, Studio Gang's project. Extrusions are really not as simple as they seem. And so we worked really closely with uh, the Boston Valley team to refine this extrusion to make sure that uh, the clay would move through it smoothly, that the proportion of the, the holes and the actual uh, solid pieces would work well. And so, the base for this extruded column really is made up of four of these uh, pieces set back to back. And as these are extruded, they're extruded in lengths that are tall enough that they can still be carried at a manageable weight. Um, and then the cut plane defines that column uh, moving around. The cut geometry then uh, slices in and produces this um, extremely uh, varied form that is really something that you can't really predict how that'll come out until you really cut through it. And um, it looks very complex, but it's actually just made up of, at any given level, each of these um, resultant dice shapes is identical. So there are three final pieces here, type one, type two, and type three. The column itself is made up of 12 pieces. And this is about six feet tall. Uh, this is the geometry that we worked with and developed along with Boston Valley. The cut planes here you can see in blue, and the cuts are made um, on the underside. So you have the broad piece supported on the conveyor belt of the wire cutter, and then the ends uh, are also trimmed away. And here you can see uh, the wire cut pieces after they've been put through the wire cutter. This is uh, a set of three and you can see how they line up. And you can also see here the slip that has been applied on the cut face. Uh, we worked with Andy and what we wanted to achieve here in our glazing is a contrast between the cut faces and then the remaining cells and uncut faces of the pure extrusion. You can also see there's kind of a wire struck texture that's left behind on that cut face. So there's already an inherent contrast uh, and we wanted to highlight that even further. 
And so uh, Andy worked with us and did a lot of different tests of um, a slip underneath, which would be applied while the clay uh, was still wet and just had come right out of the extruder, and then an overglaze. Um, and so we selected uh, this one, which was sort of the most black and white <laughs> of, of the tests that we did. It's a little bit black and, uh, or sorry, white and blue. And uh, we just got these pictures earlier this week. We're so excited to see how they've come out. And uh, you can really see the alignment of those pieces across uh, from the wire cutter and the differentiation that you get between the cells uh, and the slip cut faces. And so each of these is one quarter of the total column. And uh, maybe when we're able to be together in person again, we'll be able to get together and assemble these into the final piece. Uh, in the virtual exhibition hall, you can see here our imagination for what these pieces might become. Uh, these are all cut at different radii of spiraling and so you'd be able to have a single extrusion produce this exuberant variety of different decorative forms and so it's using this sort of mass production process of extrusion that is what we always end up having to use for these large-scale projects um, but the result is something that in another sense you might think would have been slip cast or ram pressed um, but the wire cutter enables this mass customization. And that's it for us. Thank you very much. We'd like to thank our team and uh, Rami Abu Khalil wasn't able to be here to present with us today, but he also did a lot of work on the project. And of course, a huge thank you to Peter and uh, John and, the t and Andy and the team at Boston Valley who did a great amount of work. We'd like to thank you, Omar. We'd like to thank John, Kraus, Mitch Bring, and Andy Brayman, Peter Schmidt. Um, Andy for helping us with the initial forming and glazing, and also for um, you know Peter in particular with all the production uh, forming. It's great to be paired with SOM because there are a lot of uh, similar but distinctly on appearance, very different, but in terms of the, the philosophy, very similar ideas. Um, our team is composed of Pelly Clark Pelly, uh, which is myself, Craig Copeland, uh, Kristen Hopkins Clegg, Hedja Bilanek, who's going to be one of the presenters here today, uh, Brad Lowe, and also Z Huang, who's also going to be one of the presenters. Um, and we, we're we are especially grateful to John for facilitating uh, the three of us to be able to come up and actually do an assembly in a, uh, in a, in a safe, isolated place near the factory. Uh, and you'll see some of the images from that assembly. Um, and we also have uh, Studios Architecture as part of our team, Graham Clegg, uh, Zach Bark, Brian Kim, and then Walter P. Moore, we have Eric Verboon. Um, so we'd, we'd like to thank all of the fellow ACOP uh, participants um, for sharing your, your, your uh, respective research. And um, we're, just, we're sorry that you're not here. Uh, you're all here with us in spirit. And we look forward to a time, as Amy was saying, that we could um, look at these assemblies or perhaps do these assemblies together. Um, so this is the third year participating at ACAW and the first year was, was actually with Andy Brayman as he was one of the leaders of the team called Radical Matter and um, we, were, we were focused on reimagining the extrusion and uh, we did all kinds of different interventions with fired extrusions, with wet extrusions and among the emerging interests uh, that came out was how to intervene with extrusions in the wet state before firing. 
And this became uh, foundational uh, in terms of, and this was something that ACAW was, was facilitating, was being able to work with the materials hands-on. You know, it's again, something Eric and Amy were talking about. That's, um, you know, I, I'm sorry that the others, um, other teams have not been able to do that this year, but hopefully we'll have a chance to get their hands in the wet clay. The second year, which was last year in 2019, we formed a team uh, with PCPA Studios, Walter P. Moore, um, and we were focusing our research on an extruded rain screen. And we were interested in the dynamic process and expression of terracotta. And what we wanted to do in particular was see if there were ways to intervene um, during the wet state with robotics so that you'd have a standard extrusion, very much like what SOM is doing. And then with robotics, in our case, bending a, a fin um, to come up with something that could be more bespoke and um, alter. Out of that, uh, during that ACAW, shortly after working with John and Andy as kind of interpreting um, what we were learning in the process and afterwards, um, we, just, we, we realized that um, there were some limits to, uh, to both the, the way that we were trying to manipulate these fins um, and that we needed to create truer panels uh, with more symmetrical firing. Um, so you can see um, here that there's a, a problem with the alignment. And also, if you look closely, you could see there was some cracking that was stress cracking uh, because of the process. So um, we, we got a tremendous amount of support afterwards from both um, from John and Andy to, and, and also with Peter to develop a process that would allow um, this controllable, replicable um, variation on an industrial scale. Um, and one of the things we did was more of a symmetrical firing, but we also felt that uh, there was an opportunity to, to play more with glazing um, paired with refinements to shape the texture. And um, both Z and Pedj are gonna walk through uh, both the process and the, 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 all the way through the assembly of, of what emerged from this particular year. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna talk about uh, the shape refinement this year. As you can see, so last year we want to create the dynamic uh, terracotta wall panel. Each panel is different. So this year we are thinking simplify the and also lim limit the var variation. So instead of each panel is different, we try to use four or three uh, to stack them to create, you know, also create a, a dynamic pattern and uh, how we bend it and the direction you know of the bending and uh, yes so the next page talking about the texture so we explore different scales of the um, groups so you can see uh, from um, the first image to the second is the different scale and also we are thinking about um, the different sides of the groups from the center and the diving to the edge so during the texture exploration, the limitation is like the surface need to be at least 50% flat to, you know, to build the mold, um, to build the mold to uh, reduce the uh, deforming during the bending. So um, you can see the blue arrow here. So that co comes with our final uh, texture. And uh, during this process, we are also, you know, thinking about uh, the, um, you know, uh, the the different color. So, like like this one, you can uh, you can see the um, uh, gradient color from the center uh, to the edge. It somehow could help us strengthen the movement. And the second option we are thinking, uh, we can create a second movement in the middle. So. Uh, when you look at the flat panel, so you can see the di uh, the different color in different area, just to you know 
because of the the different separation of the color and the movement. Next page, and um, uh, so this page uh, shows where we want to have the texture. So if we want to put on the uh, on the body, or if we want to continue to the fin. Um, next. So finally, it comes to the uh, option. We want one side is flat. Uh, the another side is with the texture because it's 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 gonna maximize um, the movement and the texture with the comparison. So during all this like shape refinement uh, comes with our final profile. So there are two things we need to consider. One thing our fin need to. Uh, bear the bend, bending, and also we want our body to be straight, not curving like last year. So we are thinking the extrusion maybe have a symmetric, you know, two panels together helps strength the uh, body and the fin, and then we have more, you know, possibility to play with the bending. And the next step is the glazing. So Andy uh, sent us several options of the glazing. So uh, we play with the white one uh, and the the green one and the green blue and the, the next one is the blue. And finally, uh, when landing with this um, a gradient blue with a crystalline texture on the edge, so you can see in the pool area it's become darker, but the edge uh, somehow explodes. You can see the tan color behind it. Yeah. So that's that's the glazing option we are landing at. So we we were very excited this year to actually make it happen and uh, actually end up with a with a product that we are all uh, happy with and excited about. So we actually kind of stepped a few steps back and made uh, limited ourselves and made only two unique pieces. Um, that were really uh, carefully curated in order to uh, scale up to the larger uh, assembly. So basically here you see, I mean, this, these are numbers that mean nothing, but actually in the terracotta world, there's kind of like pushing the limits, 42 inches the maximum piece, uh, and also uh, making two unique pieces, one bending in inward and the second one in outward direction. Uh, so this is one single piece, inward piece, uh, just for the um, uh, sake of showing the what's the logic behind it. Uh, so all the pieces are oversized three inches in order to uh, do seamless cuts, and also for the last three of uh, usable, last last ends of the usable piece is basically straight in order to make a better blending and the overall assembly. So this is kind of an overview of the entire assembly. On the left side, we have two unique pieces uh, and their production size. Uh, then they're being cut in two uh, sub pieces. Uh, and we also have one uh, smaller piece that is uh, basically just a straight uh, non-manipulated uh, extrusion. So, um, I'm just going to skip uh, forward a little bit. So this is like last year, we also noticed that the stack joint uh, was something that we were not uh, super happy about and something that was kind of working against us in, in, a, in a way of uh, slowing the movement. Uh, so that's why this year we we're exploring a different kind of arrangement and uh, different kind of uh, moving away from stack. Uh, Joint, but more of a staggered or different ways of exploring it. And in addition to flat panel, this year we kind of introduced a, a uh, freestanding element uh, that can be used as a in this uh, in this case uh, abstract column. Um, uh, and also in addition to that, uh, like everyone else, being uh, completely overwhelmed by the glaze world, uh, <laughs> we were thinking like, how do we how do we control the glaze? Uh, how how not to get overwhelmed with the color and 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 find the right balance and the scale of using the right glaze? Uh, so that's why we um, at some point played with introducing a cold white glaze. Um, 
And also to remind everyone, uh, we're still kind of looking into an industrial way of manipulating uh, their kind of pin in order to achieve endless possibilities. But this year, uh, we kind of decided to step back and make uh, uh, fewer pieces in order to uh, kind of finesse the, the industrial process that's available right now. So this is a roller that was the Andy was uh, developing uh, that can help us to actually achieve that goal further down the road, uh, actually be able to produce endless variation in the uh, industrial process of uh, extruding terracotta. Uh, this is where we landed this year, and um, basically using uh, molds to uh, achieve the shapes that we were after, um, kind of scaling back, uh, reducing number of pieces. Um, and this is showing basically all our kitter parts um, that were used to assemble our uh, final assembly. This was taken just two days ago. Um, next image is kind of the final glaze that we uh, chose in a in a shade um, environment, and this the next image is showing it this same glaze uh, outside in the sun. Uh, in addition to exploring the glaze, we thought we were done with the glaze, but that's not the end of the glaze. It's also like how many times you apply the glaze um, on the surface and what kind of a surface uh, the glaze applied to. Um, and also Boston Valley also admitted that they have some uh, issues actually realizing what is this glaze about, why is it behaving so strangely uh, on a flat and a scored surface. Uh, so over in the foreground, you see a glaze applied four times, and in the background, you see glaze applied uh, three times, and quite a significant difference. Um, this is a detail of a glazed piece that has a glaze applied uh, four times, and you see deep uh, blue pulling. Um, and now we're going to slowly move from the inside, the outside of our assembly, because we were lucky enough to actually assemble uh, our piece. So this is a side of the assembly that has the uh, scoring and the grooves. Uh, and this is the other side that's uh, flat uh, and doesn't have any, any uh, texture. And it still has labels on it. Um, uh, we had some fun assembling it and also learned, uh, learned a lot because uh, the column piece and other uh, more complicated pieces probably need some more thought in the further down the road how to assemble it and how to make it more uh, know, applicable in the, in the future. Um, and this is in a, like an interior lighting, uh, just under fluorescent lighting. Uh, and this is our assembly uh, column as well as a flat panel in a daylight. Uh, uh, we are really happy uh, with how it came out. Uh, glaze has, uh, from the images that you showed that we were kind of afraid of having too much glaze, I think we ended up having just the right amount of glaze and the uh, character in the glaze. As you can see in uh, sunlight, there's uh, quite a lot uh, play in the glaze and the reflections and uh, shadows and a different side of pooling. Uh, couple of images of details of the assembly uh, in the sunlight. Um, this is a column assembly. Um, and this is the final image uh, of the assembly on the outside. Super. Uh, the glaze looks absolutely beautiful. Uh, that's great. Um, Thank you. So we're uh, going to now next go to our last uh, presentation. Um, if you want to get uh, Smith and Gill, uh, start up your presentation. Um, so thanks, Omar. Thanks for everyone sticking around. Um, this is uh, Team ASGG. Um, I'm Anthony Viola. I'm joined by our internal team of Ram Rodriguez and Nick uh, Birchtold. Um, we had some good collaborators on this project. Um, you guys can see my screen. Um, we had the core studio from Thornton Tomasetti and their facade group, uh, Charles Portelli, Silver, Silverio Patrizzi, and Amadine Sir Somo. Um, I'd like to also thank our uh, 
the University of Buffalo team, Carlos and Jonathan, um, and the ACOD team that we would uh, scramble weekly to meet with, um, Mitch, Peter, and Andy, that's what awesome. Oh, here's just a picture of us as well. So cool, our, um, our investigation, um, you know, we started off, this is our first year at ACO. Um, our investigation started off being, um, you know, really look at trying to um, embed or augment technolo technology into the material or processes or configuration of the terracotta and to make it into a polyvalent terracotta cladding system. So this was like super ambitious. We had no idea what the heck we were doing. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and so we, you know, we kind of dove deep in. We, we were pretty adamant about, um, you know, the work that Smith Gill is, is you know, high rise building design. So, um, you know, we, we did want to make it a facade system and I could, you know, kind of point out some of the pitfalls and things that we did um, along the way, again, this being our first ACOP, one of them was biting off too much, um, more than we could choose. So, so um, I think this is, you know, sort of how we could focus. So I'm gonna present in the virtual environment here and just let me know if it's like kind of crazy. I'll take it slow. Um, so just real quickly, you know, our investigation, um, you know, this early stuff, we looked at, you know, material precedents and historical uses, not having a whole lot of experience with it. What we were really taken with um, was the, you know, the Gustavino vaulting, um, which is, you know, pretty awesome in that um, it does a lot of, it has a lot of things going for it. It has low tech, low embodied carbon material, um, but in a configuration that's really efficient structurally, uh, complex fluid geometries, um, just, you know, great. And, and um, we also looked at these, um, the structural terracotta block that were developed in the early 1900s um, that I think were born out of, you know, the fact that they were lighter weight than traditional masonry, um, fireproofing, and early high rise steel frame buildings. Um, and it could be configured in a way that allowed it to be vertical horizontal application, depending on how they kind of tweak the cell configuration. This is something that like um, the studio gang guys also, I think, found very enamorating. Uh, and I think you know, it would be great to chat with them about it. Um, because it's, you know, for us, it, it was really, you know, a different way of looking at a problem. Traditionally, if I look at this diagram, we're just looking at how we would develop buildings internally at ASGG. It happened to be like, you know, we'll come from the overall form and, and get down to the component design. And, and we do, it is a circular process. Um, but I think, you know, in general, our feeling is that the most, you know, damage or good could be done, you know, with the overall building design versus uh, this exploration. And we really wanted to look at, let's go down to the crystal scale and, um, you know, try to design a component that then could be aggregated. Um, so one of the matrices that we developed kind of as we were going through this early investigation, just exploratory stuff was um, this idea of local and global modification. So local, you know, things that we could do, um, you know, to the material or to slight, you know, local configuration, but then when it aggregated itself in the facade that is, um, you know, performative. So an example of this is, you know, actually like, um, you know, an early investigation into um, looking at TX active products um, within either the clay body or in glazes. And, and again, this is again, part of our biting off more than we could chew. Um, this was something that, you know, we, we could have spent an entire workshop investigating that and Andy and and Peter and Mitch were very good about kind of bringing us back and understanding that that was maybe, you know, a little bit more than what was able to be done during the workshop. But, you know, we did understand, you know, that there's, that, that, um, that a post, a post fired, uh, cold applied or warm applied, uh, relatively warm applied to the surface um, would allow us to, you know, possibly um, integrate some TX, um, um, coatings on the surfaces, which would allow us to, you know, have a material which is, um, you know, able to, to feed smog and, and um, increase the air quality. Um, so, you know, again, we looked at different ways that the surface could be modified. And then when you look at it kind of at an overall, as we step through, you know, sort of a, uh, an example fin, we can, um, you know, we'll, we'll see that the, as you increase these sawtooths, the overall surface area increases, you know, by 60%. So in this case, there's a direct correlation between that and how much VOC smog eating potential it has. Um, 
So that was, you know, very interesting to us. Um, and in the way that we sort of looked at, um, you know, these three tiles, we'll show you, um, you know, then when we take that small surface texture application um, and put that on extruded components, um, you know, initially our thought was that, you know, Boston Valley would be able to extrude these great ribbons and be able to bend them in some of these configurations, um, you know, as uh, the Pelly Clark Pelly team pointed out, you know, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of cracking and investigation that would have to be done with that. Um, but, you know, this is us just sort of playing and, and I'm trying to understand some of the material properties. And, and in this case, what we were looking at was how could we make these modifications to say a fin structure that would change orientation um, for, you know, things like solar orientation, or if we um, apply photovoltaic cells to it, how it could be best oriented towards the sun how they could be twisted to, um, you know, change the axis of bending um, in a way that, you know, can make it structurally more sound and, or change the density and opacity of a wall. So if it is going to be a part of a wall system, the, you know, the window to wall ratio is an important thing that we want to be able to say, we can, you know, we can accommodate a high window to wall, wall ratio or high solid portion of the wall um, in a sort of beautiful way. So then, you know, again, this is presenting as if it's a linear process, but it being circular, um, you know, we developed sketches, which were just like, okay, now how do we take those individual thin pieces and collect them together? And Haram, uh, you can talk about, the, you know, once we once we came up with some of those sketches yeah. and, and I think the, that, the process of evaluating it. Yeah, I think after the initial, you know, sketching form, uh, there had to be a, like a drawback to make sure that we can rationalize some of these forms that we actually taking paper, right, and, and making them feasible for us to do the analysis. So. What we ended up doing was just to compile all this information into a uh, grasshopper design script and using that as a means to iterate through the design, right? We want to make sure that we can get the most out of it and investigate as many options as we can through in the early in the design process. And basically what we did end up doing, it was, it was basic, you know, a Bayesian curve, a variation of extrusion and, and the form outside as well. The, the, um, the texturing as well as Anthony was looking at it. And what we ended up using, it was an evolutionary solver called Wallace. Uh, and this is a multi-object uh, optimization uh, engine. And all it is, is you put a lot of information there, meaningful information, uh, and you get the best, you get, you get to pick the best options that you can uh, uh, analyze for. And for us, some of the matrix, you know, some of the outputs were enormous amount of data and library that have quantifiable information that we can use. And this is very meaningful for us to in order to create benchmarks and identify, you know, which of these can then go into a format that we can then subsequent do more analysis. And, you know, useful information, what is that? You know, for us was weight, useful daylight, uh, views, wind to wall ratio, material, all those things. And the idea here is to actually create a data set that we can use for different places, right? So we're doing this for Chicago, but there's other areas where we build, uh, we're an international company, so there's other ways that we can address those by going back into this library and picking those elements that we, we generated for. Um, so that overall inform also, we did a sort of like a, a embodied carbon analysis on the form as well, prior to the uh, AFE model. And, you know, I, it was mentioned in the previous presentations, you know, um, Terracal doesn't have that much body carbon, but the overall system that holds it does. <laughs> so I think thinking, having involved in that process early on in design and in this library data set is important because it's important for the client, for ourselves, for everybody else to understand that, you know, it's just in the Terracal, the version of the system then uh, adjusted and hung and, and the connections and all that information. And during this process, as you saw some of these uh, uh, curve, curvilinear forms, we had to split those forms into uh, two types. Uh, we had a slip cast and extruded form. And uh, if you go into our space, you should be able to see those forms. And one of the things that we wanted to make sure we understand and quantify and analyze was the X form that was going to bridge between these kind of uh, stacks and between these forms. And uh, TT, Thornton Tomaselli in New York City, the facade group did the uh, FE analysis. And what have we asked them to do is to not just do a analysis of just normal uh, PSF uh, for the uh, form, but 
increased to see whether or not the phone will fail. And to our surprise, it didn't fail. It, 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 we went through it, it, it was fine. The only issue that we found or we saw is that at the pin connections, that's where the, uh, the, the, the most of the uh, problems happen. And this is something that we had to work through the process of involving all the teams I mean, Boston Valley, TT ourselves to understand what those connections will be to the facade, to the to the uh, to the slab, and resolve them in that connection itself. So overall design, right? And for this project, we had to right slipcast and extruded, so we had to incorporate two types of um, uh, connections to support it. And it just it it gives you that kind of like okay, so. <laughs> Now that we went through, we went through this process, right? Like, how do you can simplify some of these things and 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 understand that you know um, some of these designs will have a uh, a a you know a dribble effect, right? It will affect other things uh, within the building, and we wanted to make sure that whatever we designed was something feasible for ourselves and uh, other people. And these are just options that we came up with at the beginning of uh, throughout the process, right? Uh, how we fluctuated those uh, fins, uh, what was the support uh, within those elements, and this informed as well the our body carbon um, analysis. And if you want to talk about the uh, Anthony, if, if we added a couple of other things in there um, um, at the end that might be useful. To <laughs> To, we didn't get yeah, to yeah. investigate them, but I think that's a future uh, research that we would like to finish with. Right. So we, yeah, not having the you know the full mock-up here, we've been um, you know we've been testing um, a way to um, you know basically embed some technology into the panels themselves. So um, because these fluted surfaces are then coated with a the um, you know, coated with the TX active solution, they're, you know, oriented in the right way to, you know, provide shade down the building. We, we can sense things in the interior environment, like, um, you know, how much radiation is incoming, how many, um, you know, how the, the, how much, if there was photovoltaics applied to these um, slope surfaces, how they would be performing, but also on the exterior environment, how, um, you know, the panels are doing in terms of, uh, you know, eating the smog and, and reducing VOCs. Um, so these are, you know, just um, technology that we've been using to measure those variables within our office and ready to embed into these tiles. Um, and one thing that, you know, that, um, you know, is part of our embedded panel is like an LED strip that runs the length of uh, the X and the extruded form, um, which are, you know, shown here in these um, sort of night renderings. Um, and these are a couple of just, Parting shots, which were hot off the press shots from Andy, of uh, pieces coming out of the kiln now, um, which has a very light, um, sort of simple glaze, um, just to kind of not not be too combative with the complexity of the forms, um, and to also you know be a be a better surface to apply these um, TX solutions to. So. Um, that's about it. We'll walk you back. Right now, we're producing the or the parts that you see are for a 35% scale mock-up. Uh, you know, we we went back and forth a lot to talk about do we want to build full-size pieces or a scale. So we, we did the scale so that you could see an aggregate of these um, of the facade. So that's the piece that you see in front of you, um, and then this is the wall, which is the full-scale version of that. Cool. Cool. Super. Great, thank you. Um, so what I'll ask you to uh, do is, is just have uh, uh, everybody who is just on a panel just to uh, make themselves the videos visible. Maybe we get ourselves started with just some, uh, some questions. One of the things that I'm um, uh, intrigued by, of course, with this group, there are two of you that are, of course, come back uh, uh, from last year and sort of building on it. And, and, and um, Smith and Gill is 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 a newcomer here, and of course, uh, getting a, a better sense of, of this material. Um, I think the uh, uh, the interest of you know uh, the mass production and the customization problem, uh, especially with uh, uh, one of the things that it, that with terracotta, it is of course it's it's all custom made. Uh, There's nothing sitting on the shelf, uh, but this manipulation of uh, uh, the whole process in order to it, 
Can you guys speak a little bit? Is this just a desire for more uh, var variability? Uh, what is the underlying kind of uh, motivation for uh, that level of manipulation of, of form? Uh, and um, uh, at the same time, I know for those two that have come back, uh, could you speak a little bit how this is feeding into, let's say now, a real, uh, maybe real projects or, or things you're thinking about? Um, yeah, for sure, we could start off with that. <laughs> um, we, sure. you know, this is absolutely, you know, when we started the ACA workshop, you know, we, we had projects online and this is you know, absolutely right in our wheelhouse of what could be applied on projects. Um, what I do think that what we find in some of our projects is that there are very tuned facades for, you know, for different orientations or for different climates. And so um, having that variability is important to us to make it, you know, reactive and, and responsive to the environment. Um, and I think, you know, in other materials, you were very constrained by what the outcome was going to be. You know, you're very, you're designing the, the, you know what the component is um, versus with the terracotta. We didn't know what the component is until really until very late in the game. I mean, all that stuff that we saw at the beginning was all just like, you know, designing a sort of, um, um, it, it was a, you know, it was designing a process, not necessarily what the outcome is. Um, and so I think that that was really cool to then be like, okay, Hey guys, you know, Peter and Andy, how do we build something like this or what could we do? You know, how is the material going to react to do that? And they're like super experienced with just being able to realize that and to make the whole thing, you know, better because of that, because it's a custom piece, uh, you have all of a sudden a little bit more flexibility because it's, structural you have flexibility because it's you know the high thermal mass everything that everybody mentioned today it's like all that embedded technology into the into a low-tech low embodied carbon material um is is really like again now immediately applicable in a lot of projects we do um i can oh jump in as well um this is amy from som and uh you know, we, I, I think it took us last year to sort of understand what uh, the capability of some of this research was for. So I really look forward to seeing what Smith Guild does next year. <laughs> um, and I, I think um, our project, and I think Pelly Clark Pelly and Studios' project as well, is a reaction to the linearity of extrusion um, you know, something that you can see here also in Smith Gill's project, in order to escape a linear expression of the facade, you have to go to something like a slip cast joint piece. And on projects in the real world, you're often really pushing back against strict budgets or strict timelines um, and slip cast even sometimes um, will break that and allow terracotta to be taken off the table entirely. So I'm not saying that the wire cutter is uh, maybe ready for prime time yet in terms of the production line, but you could imagine a world in which the extruder goes right into the wire cutter and the process is really streamlined and allows you to get the variation and complexity um, of non-linear surfaces. Um, into something that has the same budget and timeline of an extru a pure extruded piece. Yeah, I could, I could build upon what Amy is talking about because what, what really interests us um, these, these two years is starting with the foundation of a rain screen, which is a, which is a fundamental uh, enclosure system. And then having components that are manipulatable on that particular, uh, with that system. And in our case, it's a fin. Uh, in the case of SOM, they're working with a kind of a, a hollowed solid block, if you will, that could be manipulated and express that manipulation. But it's the idea that if you work with the foundation of a robust functional component with something that can be expressive, that maybe you could have a standard extrusion that's manipulated in the wet state, either with a, with a wire cutter 
or with a robot, which we're interested in. Um, and you could start to tune a building. You could tune it for aesthetic expression. You could tune it for uh, environmental response. That's, that's one part of the, the picture. The other part is that you have this, this standard um, robust process that Boston Valley has, has with their clay body. They have a very stable, heavily researched uh, series of clay bodies that are the foundation of all of their pieces, whether it's extruded or otherwise. And then you have the, the capabilities with glaze to just take off into you know, a myriad of, of possibilities. So it's those possibilities with, with terracotta and especially with the way Boston Valley has opened up uh, this particular set of uh, research with, with all these different firms that makes uh, such, a, such an, in, um, uh, an exciting uh, set of possibilities for, for all of us. Craig, this is Amy. Can you talk a little bit about, I know you guys, well, from insight from our work with Peter, I know you guys were looking at using the wire cutter as a, a, for, a way of deforming these fins. What happened with that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, next year <laughs> yeah it was we, it looked really promising um, of course of course our newbies here are going to realize this if they haven't already there there are a lot of rabbit holes that that come out of ACAW and as you're working um, last year what Amy's referring to is that uh, Peter had this the, the wire cutter which you saw that that, um, that uh, SOM was was presenting Eric and Amy that um, we were playing with it as well. We, we did a double, we had a double fin and we had the wire going back and forth to create these undulations. And um, we were doing it in part because we were waiting for our fire pieces to be available to assemble last year. Um, but we, we had to put a pin in it and stay focused on this particular research, which I'm actually glad we did because um, we didn't do that much on the glaze last year, and we saw what KPF was doing with glazes, uh, and it was, it was, we felt like, wow, that's a whole world that we should be exploring. And, and the glaze is beautiful. Yeah, I just have one, one thing. We, we were really interested, interested in um, using a wire cutter for our column assembly, uh, and I think it's something that's definitely the, that, that has a lot of potential. And, uh, that we would like to explore. Yeah, that's true. And we for um, columns, they look beautiful. And I'm, I'm glad you explained that it's four pieces together to make the column and to see the, the, uh, the virtual model because we saw them laid out, which in and of themselves look, look intriguing, but are even more, uh, are even more uh, intriguing in the idea of putting them together. Thanks. Uh, Amy, just a quick question about the, uh, the glazing. Uh, the, so you, you do the wire cutting first, and how are you glazing that? Uh, so, so because the, the interior webs are being also exposed, and it's just a, was there some, because your original ones actually showed the webs in a different way when you were cutting them after uh, firing. Right, when we did the saw cutting in 2019, you're sort of limited to the raw clay body being the exposed surface. Um, and so by cutting the wet clay, you have a little bit more flexibility with how you can manipulate that afterwards. And so um, it was basically, uh, Andy can speak to it more maybe, but it's paint roller. And so you use the, that on the exposed mm. surface. Um, and so we did some testing to see how that would run and expose at the corners. I think we were open to a little bit of a, you know, more natural look and revealing the process. Um, mm -hmm. And then the over the white glaze was just sprayed over. Um, I think any other questions? Go ahead. Sorry, Omar, I was just going to add to what Amy was saying that um, you know, that was one of the big benefits, I think, of doing the, the wire cutter, where to get a similar effect with the saw cutting, it would require kind of twice through the kiln, um, mm -hmm. applying a second layer of glaze over the previously glazed surface. So this was kind of a, a unique opportunity to kind of apply the glaze twice before it's fired at all, um, and then have the glaze kind of interact together. I think that was a really cool thing to see. 
there's a yeah. there's a new tool that John was showing us in the factory um, that has it has two or three wires that can cut the extrusion perpendicular. And the reason that's important is you could get precise cuts within a tolerance. Um, John's gonna, <laughs> he's probably gonna say I'm too tight, but you know, within a tolerance of uh, maybe a quarter of an inch over the course of four feet. And the reason that's important is that um, what we did this year was the glaze was done as, as Pedja was presenting uh, with three extra inches on either side, and then it was cut afterwards, so you leave these exposed edges. But by cutting it in the process, and this could be lined up with the with the extruders, by cutting it in the process, you could glaze all the sides. So you can expose those if you have a, a rain screen with joints. 